My name is Jason Thomas. I'm the co-founder and CTO of CoScreen. Today I'm here with Emma Livov, the uh, founder of the Jitsi hey, Project. Um, would you like to, well, very close, would you? <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on your background and your relationship to the Jitsi project? Yeah, uh, uh, so it started up as a as a student project in 2003, uh, and then it gradually became more and more popular with the, with the community. I was using it as a validation tool in my in my research work, and and then it it felt like a like a good thing. Um, it was helping people solve problems, and it looked like. Uh, there was enough, you know. It was it was a good way to. We felt like we wanted to earn our bread with it. So, uh, Yana and I, Yana was my company co-founder. We created a startup around it that was offering services around Jitsi, and and then others came on board gradually, and we ended up uh, being acquired by Atlassian in 2015, and then eventually we changed hands because Atlassian exited the collaboration business. So we we uh, are now part of Eight by Eight, but. You know, it's 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 been 17, uh, 17 years, and uh, for those seventeen years, we've been focusing pretty much exclusively on. Oh, actually, eighteen years at this point. Uh, so yeah, we've been uh, focusing. Uh, that's that's so been I, our job. I recall back when you guys were originally like SIP yeah, communicator, right? And like gee. the video bridge was actually just sort of a SIP bridge. And I actually was following it back then because I worked at a company called Sorensen Communications, and we were thinking about maybe using. It because our our service was entirely SIP based and everything and uh, you know like when when you guys I mean now everything's WebRTC obviously you guys integrated WebRTC into the video bridge uh, I don't I don't even recall when it's been so long now it seems like I can't even remember before that but like you've been sort of dedicated to open source through that whole time and I know there was a lot of like consternation when you guys got acquired by Atlassian that maybe that would change right because that changed for Curento it changed for lots of other uh, players in the same space, you know, and so how, how have you managed to maintain being this sort of open source leader and like keeping your open source identity uh, this entire time? And like, what is your, what do, what do you feel about like the future moving forward and your dedication to open, open source moving forward with 8x8? So, you know, um, that's a that's a great question. So so how how would I phrase this? Um, when when people acquire companies, um, especially in high tech, uh, this is this this would be less true for something like uh, you know biotechs or things like that. But especially in tech, um, eight times out of ten, it's because of the team, right? Um, to some extent, right. it's because you know they already have a code basis. To some extent, it's because of Actually, you know, um, um, even even user bases, I would I would count at a later stage acquisition. Like in order for a startup to get acquired for its user base, I would say that's you know, um, it, it's not the stage that I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking about earlier stage that that you know we have this 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 nice product and the the, the acquirer sees it as okay, this is going to expand our portfolio pretty nicely. It fits pretty well. We're going to conquer additional. Additional business. So when a, a startup gets acquired at an early stage because of a technology, it's not really the code. Uh, in, in, it's not really patents if they even exist. It's about the team, and this is in, this is in, this is all the more true when the, the source code is, is 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 open source. And and I shouldn't have said all the more true. It is all the more obvious. You know, the mechanics of a deal when you acquire an open source company aren't much different, you know, by, the, by, by I know, when, when people, when Slack acquired Screen Hero about the same time, it was a similar deal to Atlassian acquiring Jitsi. Um, but yet one was open source and one, and one wasn't. And you kind of think, well, but the open source one, I mean, why did they acquire it? There's the code, is, they could have just used the code. Why didn't they take the... Uh, didn't they just take that? And obviously, that's preposterous. You don't even think Screen Heroes in the same ballpark as Jitsi, right? They're very, you know, Screen Heroes is a, like a product. It's like the front. Of I mean, the, they both. I mean, they were like all of the back end. Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, a chat application uh, acquiring a small startup to right. enable its video service, like for the same purpose, same kind of small company, except right. that one of it that's is true. one of it is is open source. So you you, you think. Um, 
I think that really it, it's like you know calls the bluff on the on the tech. It's not really a bluff. But it's like it, it really helps you dispense with the myth that you're that people are actually paying for the source code. You know, because there's very, right. very many um how should I say that? It's not putting the it's not writing the lines of code that is really complicated. It's the fact that you have had a team together who was able to 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 build it and who was who is able to maintain it and who is able to progress it as quickly as you need, especially in the context of an acquisition. You know, you would have an, a pending integration within another larger product, um, and you need that right. original team to help you with that. You know, as we're going, you know, as an example, um, like like we're going through various standardization processes within eight by eight, and the the parts that are the most painful to standardize to standardize are the ones where the founding members of the team have moved around, either either to another team or to another company. Because it becomes very, very hard for for everyone to realize, okay, what is it that's going on here? Why was this? Why has this happened this way? Can we change it that way? All of these questions become very hard to answer, and change becomes very difficult. So, so I would just to, to bring it back home. Um, people, when people acquire small companies, they actually really just acquire the people. And now, going back to your question, how do you make open source survive an acquisition? And I would say. Well, it really depends on how much it was about the open source from from the start, how much it matters to people. You know, if if that's the main thing that matters to all the to 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 everyone in the team, it becomes obvious. Like, and 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 no one, I would say, you know, I don't believe that Twilio ever had the intention to no, we're going to do nothing for open source. I think what happened was that as they were going through the motions of embedding Curento within the Twilio infrastructure constraints occurred and it became too much hassle to satisfy the Twilio constraints and to keep the, the open source project on part. Uh, time was of the essence and then someone just, it wasn't probably even a question. It wasn't a decision that was taken at some point and I'm speculating. I suspect it just, you know, stayed behind and, and no one really thought of it. Um, and and in Jitsi, I, I, it, it, it just didn't happen. That, that part, the community aspect mattered to matter to everyone in the team. I, I'd say that I've evolved a lot um, in terms of how ideologically I was seeing things when I was young and how I'm seeing them now. But I would say that even if you remove that ideological naive aspect of open source, the true pragmatic, really thrilling aspect of open source is, is, is so powerful that it's really hard to... Um, to, to give it up like it, it feels like it's such an asset you don't want to give it up it's an asset because you have these easy collaboration with other companies it's an asset because um you get to exchange ideas with others you get to 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 form you know sort of these teams with other people who work it's it, it's it's well, I'd probably need to start that sentence from the start if I have to formulate this properly, but it's, it mattered a lot to everyone from the team. So we just kept it going. And it was the same thing happened at 8x8. Eight eight. And there were challenges, you know, when you're going in. And, and we were not a cloud company when we got acquired by Atlassian. We, we, had some, we, we had an appliance, right? You download that and you run it yourself. We had to become a cloud company at Atlassian. And it was very tempting to just say, oh, you know, we're not going to. We're going to worry about that later. The open source part, and it's like brushing your teeth every morning. It's like you just look. It's it's the part of it that I could really dispense with because I just like go and sip my coffee or whatever. But um, but I just it's just something I do. It's just part of my routine, and I can't really conceive of breaking it of breaking that routine. Yeah, I have to say, um, for us at least, like the. Um the open source that aspect of Jitsi is what brought us to the platform, right? It's what's brought me continually through my career to it is that, you know, I can go to the Jitsi forums, I can ask a question, and you guys have always been extremely aggressive about answering questions, about giving very good sets of details about why something went wrong or when it, where it went wrong, giving great feedback, and then I can always go look at the source code and understand, like, okay, exactly what is happening here, you know? And I think that you know, when I look at Twilio or when I look at other solutions, to me, it's kind of scary because I know as a fact that I've never met the perfect video conferencing solution. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never met a solution that just works out of the box for, for a particular task. And um, 
and it's it's much more comforting knowing that there's this great team behind it. Like you said, I I agree they they acquired your team, um, but beyond that, like that there's this source base that is something that's just this blank sheet you can go read, right? And so if something goes wrong, you can always go and look and understand why it's happening. You don't have to go through some through some difficult customer service process. You don't have to be the thing that's on the lowest the lowest priority when you're a startup, right? You you have to have some certainty about the tools you're using that that you as a team can advance them to that stage uh, or to the next stage or whatever, right? And I think open source gives you a lot of comfort around I, that. I, I, think, I, I, I completely agree with and you, so, although I would say that you guys are in a special situation because you have the competence to actually go and understand that stuff, and that is very, 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 very rare. Um, so, but but once you do acquire that competence and, and, and once you're able to, to know and to, to actually go and fix the issues, um, then this matters a lot. It matters less when you can't fix the issues. Like, right. like it's, even if the code is available, right. I mean, whatever, right? So, and there's a, a large number right. of people in that um, in that case. And obviously, we can't all be specialists in everything. But yeah, absolutely. And and I think for a startup, there's something else that's important. Is okay. First of all, you know that in your case, because you have that competence, you know that you can go and fix the issues. Even if, you know, it's not on our plate this week and we can only get to it in two weeks, you know, but, well, I can go and look at it, right? Right. But there's something more important. Let's say that even for a more traditional startup where, look, we don't have the video um, assets, uh, the sort of video developer, the video expertise at this point, um, right. you can still tell yourself something very important. It's like, all right, I'm going to pay them for now. I'm going to, you know, take their service. But I know that if I grow too much so that their pricing model start becomes a concern or if they evolve in a direction that I dislike and, and I'm big enough to, to be own, able yeah. to afford it, if I'm big enough for this to matter, then I know that I'd be able to go on down my own path. Um, and, 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 you right. know, that completely um, removes the vendor lock-in part. And, and it's... Uh, hopefully, we're, I mean, we're going to work to make sure that this doesn't happen and that people are, are, are happy with us at whatever stage and whatever volume. But this is obviously one of the things, it's, it's, it's one of the signals that we put out there. Look, that's how much we mean it, that we're going to stay honest with you because we're putting this, we're putting ourselves in your hands. You can take that stuff and run it yourself at any point if we become too disagreeable. Um, so. That's the thing with uh, Jazz, it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? Which is that, you know, if there is something fundamentally broken or something wrong, like we don't have to necessarily go that full route of deploying it ourselves in order to get a change, right? We can go contribute it back to the open source project. And then like maybe in a month, you guys might actually integrate it and push it out to your to your production infrastructure, yeah. you know? And I think that, that that's actually like uh, something that you can't say about Twilio or almost any other platform, you know? And I think... You know, like when I worked at HireVue, you know, we had to enable SPIP support for um, for Jitsi, right? We had to go build against Bouncy Castle and like uh, replace all of the uh, DTLS implementation underneath with with that. And you know, we had a bunch of conversations with uh, I don't know, B Baldino. I don't remember. Like there were these these you know these very active members, um, probably pe members of your team that were extremely helpful in that process. You know, and I I, I thought that was great. You know, I haven't. I have worked with very few projects where there's been that much transparency well, I'm, about. I'm very you know, what's happy to hear you say that for sure. And I, 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 again, I have to say, um, it's it's much easier to communicate with us once you've done your for people who, do, who have done their due diligence, which again is is your guy's case. Uh, there are people who are, you know, I would say. You know, like they, they they would come with us with a request, and of which they have done like twenty percent only of the work, yeah. and it's like, well, how do you do the rest of the eighty percent? And really, most people are, well, I don't even know, I don't, I don't know, and it's, and 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 they would just, you know, most people like. So that's one of the things that's interesting about open source that people don't really understand. Um, when people go to a, to a company for for support, they ask a question, and an absence of answer means the company has bad support because you're paying them and they're not holding their end of the bargain. Right. Um, when you when you're dealing with an open source project, what you do is you put out a question that gets seen by a bunch of people, each of which gets makes an individual decision about whether or not they can answer that question. So when you when your question requires too much work, they will say either I don't know the answer or I don't have the time to 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 answer now. So if if you make the developer do eighty percent of your work answering the question, yeah, chances are that all the people reading your question would just go and say I can't be the person who answers. But 
uh, if, as in your case, it's like, look, I did this, I did this, I did this. And by the way, while doing that, you show everyone else how much work, how serious you are and how serious you're treating the right. transaction, the, the, it's not a transaction, it's an interaction. Then, and then, first of all, that really lessens the amount of work that the person on the other side has to do. But also, it, it just shows them that, uh, okay, this is someone who's serious about it. They've put in their time. And so that makes you all the more inclined to just go and engage because you know you're going to have a meaningful interaction. I have to say, like the you guys have been very friendly. I've asked some really dumb ass questions on uh, on the Jitsi forums too. Well, I have trouble believing answers, that. So but... you guys are pretty great. So <laughs> no, I, I can I can assure you that's the case. But yeah, it, it's so as as a you know like moving moving forward. Um, now that you're part of eight by eight, you know, like it seems like is Jas kind of going to be the core product that you guys are focusing on moving forward? Are there any other products that are going to be, you guys are going to be pushing the, you know, you don't have to tell me anything that is, you know, confidential or whatever, right, yeah. right? but it, like you can confirm yes or no, or is, is jazz going to be the thing? Yeah. Or from there, from a meetings perspective, your... jazz is probably the most important thing for us now because um, it's, um, it's a world that we currently see rather unoccupied the world of, uh, and, 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 and we have to be clear that, you know, our typical customer is, is somewhat different from you, um, also because you consume us at a different level. Um, and you actually are, right. are, are giving us confidence that we can probably, um, start being more official about our lower level access. Um, uh, we, we hope you, you continue with that. Uh, we're <laughs> probably going to lean <laughs> in it more because yeah. you've shown us that it isn't that painful. But then again, it's because you guys are great. So we'll see about that. But, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's it's something that we, we we'd like to stabilize in terms of uh, interaction with with eight by eight. But yeah, it bec like it's it's if if you think of it um, from a meetings perspective, um, it became rather um, obvious in the past year that you know the world isn't lacking in meeting solutions, uh, generic meeting solutions that you know. Um, you know, people struggled with software. People struggled with with configuring their hardware. Maybe people struggled with conf with with configuration. No one ever said, "Oh my gosh, there's no software that I can do my meeting on." Right? That just that just didn't happen. What 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 did happen, however, is like a ton of friction around. Okay, so how do I embed a meeting in my process, in my workday, um, and uh, how do I how do I make it? Um, you know, how, how, how do I just waste less time w w over meetings? And then you have all these verticals that start developing um, with regard to, well, you know what, we're just going to worry about the meeting in that specific scenario. And it could be, you know, just, uh, you know, let's be completely crazy and random here. You know, maybe someone could say, let's make it easier for knowledge workers to collaborate and share their screens, right? That could be something that someone suddenly decides to do. Uh, and let's make it yeah. like, let's have this common screen and, and among people. That's a very neat idea. No one else does, does that at this point. Um, but also it's not for everyone, right? It's, it's a, probably not something that um, my dad would do with his buddies when, when, when they're chatting. Um, it's, it's for a specific subset of users. Um, and then you have something, someone that would do something for similar for lawyers and someone would do something similar for doctors and, um, I think that that right now, if you wanted to do one of those verticals, the options out there on the market are, well, we just have to build everything from scratch. Um, and, and what we're trying to say is, no, actually, you probably, 80% of what you want is probably just a standard meeting experience. And you likely just want to tweak it a little bit, maybe put it in one side or in the other. Um, and, and we're going to help you with that. So, um, so, so we think there's, 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 that was at least the initial thinking and that was validated from our first months of, of, of operation. And not only that, but now we're actually realizing that even when on the market of, thanks to you, that even on the market of low level thanks. APIs, well, what we have advantages there as well. So there's reason enough for us to, to, uh, to go in and invest in streamlining that process as, as well. So things actually should become easier for you guys as well. That's the thing is like, it's like you say, you know, I, I do think that conferencing has been kind of commoditized, right? There was a yeah. time when like, you, where, where this stuff was hard, right? This was a very hard problem to solve 10 years ago, you know, and I think that's what you guys were working on. And, you know, it was very strange to see like Zoom kind of pull ahead and become this very, 
widely adopted solution because I don't really see the quality in Zoom as being much better than like what you see in Jitsi Meet or or even Hangouts or you know. Um, what do you think was the differentiation that kind of made Zoom this kind of leader in the conferencing space where um, yeah. other platforms have kind of fallen behind, right? I don't see this huge technological difference between both. So, um, so I, I, um, I, I really like um, uh, this American economist, Thomas Sowell, and, and he has a, a book where he talks about uh, different outcomes from different groups and, and you know, why there are... Um, just different results and he has this example about now imagine that um there's there's um you know some uh, status in society uh, that is achieved by people who have five all of five characteristics and imagine that the likelihood of you having every single one each each of those characteristics is 66 percent. let's say that two out of three people have it um but as you start combining them, the likelihood of everyone having all the characteristics like really, really quickly drops and, it, and, and the vast majority of people do not possess the five of them together. So I think really right. that's the, in, in simply put, this is where Zoom did a really good job. Like they are a juggernaut of stuff you can do. So there's, there's, they, they've added just so much, um, functionality in, in their product that, um, I don't think you would ever find like if you if you if you were to uh, you know if you were to ask a million people tell us the five things the five most important things for you in Zoom or the ten most important things uh, you, you, you would find a similar situation like for 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 every one of those ten that they tell you, you'd probably find out that two out of three other meeting products also has that have that functionality but like the number of meeting products who combine all of these features is is probably very low now. What they're trading with is, um, is, is specifically that, um, um, you know, um, clunkiness for very specific use cases, which is why companies like yours are, are, are you know, so promising because uh, that's ex like Zoom's strength of being a very largely generic tool is also their weakness that, you know, master of none, essentially. Um, so right. you get to go and be the master of desktop remote desktop collaboration, and and someone else can be the master of uh, signing notary documents online, and someone else can be, uh, you know, something else. So um, I, I think it's and that is perfect for users, right? Because um, uh, you, you get more choice and you get to pick um, what works best for you. And you know what I hope to see. Is that at the end of the show there would be less minutes spent in meetings, just because you'd be able to, uh, or at least in a blocking way, right? That you'd be stuck in meetings for 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 sh for shorter, uh, because um, you know uh, you'd you'd be able to get what you're doing done faster. Now the meeting the, the minute analogy might not exactly apply to you, but it's it 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 it, it kind of does. You don't what you don't want is the mini tiny slots that like 20 slots that you have in a day about meetings. Okay. I, I know that I'm never going to have heads down time today because look, I have this meeting and a half an hour out later, I have this one and a half an hour later, I have this one. You want to know, no, no, this to me is just like a regular day in the office when I'm uninterrupted with my team. And, um, and, and that's what you guys are giving. You're giving the, the, the background natural connection that team members have with each other and, and you're providing an essential tool for that. So all the things that people were able to say in this meeting, first of all, that saves them having to block these little half hour slots. But secondly, you also facilitate that, you know, absolutely precious part of working together uh, that comes from you. Hey, Daniel, did you remember when I told you this? Could you, could you please have a look at that PR? And then someone else, oh, you guys are talking about that PR. I actually wanted to tell you something about that as well. That, that ad hoc communication that's unplanned, uh, for example, I, I love how that suddenly becomes possible with with tools like yours because of their you know kind of always on aspect and not or rather unplanned. Let's do, to put it that way. So, so I'm excited about where this is headed. Yeah, but the in the office uh, sort of experience that you have, right? Where, like you said, the mechanism is you go and you hoot at your friend behind you and you go and do that sort of collaboration. Right? I think it's something that's deeply missing yeah. from like. Uh, the, the sort of in your face type of collaboration that, you know, Zoom, Zoom is a great tool for, for having meetings, right? But like you said, the, the, all these little granularized meetings 
actually distract people from doing work. And it, I, I bet, I mean, at least from the people we've interviewed about remote collaboration, you know, meetings are almost required now because you have to have meetings to sort of supplement that natural in the office kind of communication and team building. And it's starting to get to a point, or at least I feel like an inflection point where like people are, are getting very much disrupted from doing the type of, you know, especially like a, you think a developer, right? That time, that, that concerted heads down focus yeah. time is absolutely necessary to really get anything done. And the more granularized you make these little meetings, um, the more it doesn't work. And something like, you know, with co-screen, like we're using it all day and, it, and you know, it's like the, the idea that you're having these ad hoc meetings, but then you're also just sharing context and they're m more light. It's not like everyone's pulled into a room, everyone's getting pulled out of what they're doing, you know, and that's, that's a, a strong focus of ours, you know, and, you know, I, I think we do it better than a lot of other tools. I, I don't do. know how perfect we do it yet. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work behind it, but um, so the, the other part of it, you know, one of the things you were talking about was this, this background infrastructure that you guys are building. You know, I, I know from experience that it's very, very hard. Like you say, you get, when you guys start working at, a, or you, were, you said at Atlassian, you know, making this cloud solution, you know, I think in itself, right, there are companies where, where that's kind of the, you know, they're, they're maybe taking utilities like Jitsi or whatever, and then building this sort of backend infrastructure and then trying to service it out to people like, um, I forgot who we were. There was a company that was based on media soup, for instance, that were trying to do that component mm -hmm. of it. Right. And the, you know, one of the reasons why we chose Jitsi was because we know that the team that actually builds the, the appliance is the team that's doing the deployment of the infrastructure. Yeah. Right. And I feel like that gives you guys a, a very natural advantage because if anything goes wrong, you're not going and leaning on, on the team that developed the appliance that you're using. You guys know the appliance, all the way down to the bolts, right? And uh, so, how how much do you guys think that's helped you with your with your uh, sort of global deployment that you're doing now with JAS and with um, with eight by eight? And uh, and have have there been any like specific difficulties with that 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 you think other people might learn from? It 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 has uh, definitely been um, instrumental. We're not a very very large team. Um, there's essentially roughly, roughly uh, you know, 30 people in the extended meetings team in, at, at 8 by 8 which compared to uh, the teams elsewhere is is quite compact. But again, the velocity that you have, like we have, we have, uh, you know, probably half the team who's been on this for for 10 years. You know, so um, the, the the fact that you you have this focus and and you know everyone's sharing a frame of reference, like people understand each other. Um, people need to have, well, <laughs> you know, ironically, a lot less meetings per given task because everyone knows everyone else's frame of reference and they know how to, um, um, uh, they know what everyone else would think about certain problems. Um, so, and, and knowing that and then combining it with the fact that, you know, let's say um, uh, the, our architect for infrastructure um Every time he encounters a new problem in, let's say, when he's deploying new monitoring or new alarms or new scaling mechanisms or new geolocation mechanisms, um, well, first, I already said he has the experience of having worked for, with it for a long time. But secondly, he knows that the minute he misses this, he misses anything, he just needs to, you know, make a call or send a message and he would either immediately get it or he would get it in the next few days. Or he would get an answer of, uh, okay, maybe not that, but if we change it slightly, we're going to have this. And that's resolved in less than half an hour. Um, that is obviously just priceless. Now, I, I'm not going to say that this is absolutely required because obviously Amazon is running a ton of open source projects that they didn't develop and they're doing so very successfully and responsibly. Um, but I would uh, probably venture that, yeah, it's costing them a lot more effort to do than it would cost you with the founding team um, to, to, to go and do it. And the velocity that you get that way is obviously uncomparable. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Now, now. It, um, so one, the, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was going I to say that, you know, are, were there any difficulties that, that we, um, uh, that we encountered that way? It's, um, well, you have to make sure that, you know, you, you, you keep the team together because that's, because that's essential. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a difficult. This is difficulty, but but that's 
like in general, people are a company's most important asset. In this case, it becomes, you know, if you don't have that, you just, you know, that that that's it. <laughs> You're done. So so that you it sounds like you love your team. I I that's... I I am. I honestly believe that. I, like, there's no way I could say this without it sounding flat and like a platitude. I work with the best team in the world, but I'm so proud of this team. I we've we've had the the luck to go and collaborate with many many high functioning teams um uh we've we we work with the google web rdc team we we've, we've worked at atlassian many many great teams there we've talked to many other companies i have never seen a team for which i can say yeah you know maybe they perform on par with us it's it is absolutely impressive and it's it's a privilege to be in that team so there again not particularly modest That's awesome. but it's what i <laughs> you don't have to be That's... so there was this all this hubbub around uh, E2E encryption with Zoom recently, yep. right? Everybody was talking about you know this, this big security lapse with Zoom, which you know was um, mostly that they had advertised that they had E2E encryption, which they really didn't, right? Um, how important do you think uh, E2E encryption actually is? You know, it's, it seems like with the bri video bridge, right? You're, you're sending encrypted traffic. It doesn't actually keep any of it. It decrypts it and immediately re-encrypts it. You know, I, I guess there's sort of this trust factor there. But like if you're a not you're not a government entity, you're not, you know, like the, the it comes down to trusting, you know, your your provider. It comes down to trusting whoever is that that server component in the middle. And I, I think that's even probably the case with E2E encryption, because you're still having to pass the encryption keys and such. So like how how much of how important do you think E2E encryption is? Is it kind of more of a buzzword thing? Is it something that I know it's something you guys are actively experimenting with? You know, it's something that, that we want to implement because we think it'll be a good selling point for our product. But like, how important do you think it yeah. really is? Is it much ado about nothing or is it? So, um, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, you're, you're absolutely asking me that question because I know I'm going to give you a controversial answer, I, I expect. Um, <laughs> and, and that's good though. <laughs> it is good. So we have end-to-end uh, -end encryption has always been a very core um, aspect of. It. That's not the right way to put it. It has been something that we have dealt a lot with through the years. It, it even before we became GT Video Bridge, when we we had a SIP client, uh, we had end-to-end uh, -end encryption with ZRDP. Um, it's it's a technology that we love. It's a great geek project. It's 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 super fun to do, and and just as a uh, it's like, oh, look, I exchanged the keys. Now I have two layers of encryption. It's awesome. Isn't that great? Um, <laughs> I would say that that model doesn't work with cloud collaboration practically. That there's no practical uh, advantage to end-to-end -end encryption. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit over, I'm simply oversimplifying a little bit, but we're talking about, you know, the concept in general. So, uh, you, you could say, yeah, but if someone compromises you, it makes it like they have to compromise different components, uh, with end to end encryption. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm talking about compared to the past, like, so you compare to the past when the most widely known form of end to end encryption was the one that people use with email. Um, so, and, and I, I remember this day, uh, when you, when you would go to an open source conference like Debcom, like, like, sorry, like, um, uh, FOSDEM, and you would see these huge lines of people that are, you know, talking to each other. And when new, newcomers come, it's like, what are these people doing there? You know, they're signing to each other's keys. It was a point of pride. And, uh, <laughs> and when, when you go to meetups, oh, let me sign your key. It was the whole thing. So how did that work? Well, it worked because the, the people that were giving you your email client, were different from the people that were running your server, right? What's the point of doing that? Well, end-to-end -end encryption is not just like encryption where it's supposed to, um, um, and I'm sure you know this, but just to, for your for your for your audience to to, to explain it, like end-to-end -end encryption doesn't protect you against you know the hackers of your hotspot or your internet provider or or, or any such thing. It regular encryption protects you against all of these things. End-to-end -end encryption just adds one extra points point of protection which is your service provider the one that is giving you the service and so again with 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 email that worked because the people that were giving you your email client whether that's thunderbird or you know whatever other 
uh, you know, what was that? Eudora mail? That was a thing like that. Anyways, all of these yeah. <laughs> were different from, from, from the service providers. The minute we entered the cloud age, all of that disappeared. SIP was following a similar model, like you, that, that's how SIP was kind of conceived of. Oh, it's going to be like email. You're going to have a SIP user agent. That's your thing. And then you're connected to different service providers. And, and your SIP user agent is going to protect you against your SIP service provider. True. And you know, that's what we were doing with Jitsi. And it worked there as well. What didn't work was the usability of this model. Like, I mean, even setting up an email <laughs> client to connect to a server was a horrible experience. To this day, the, one, the, the ones that still support it work well because they've learned to handle the most popular email services so that you only have to enter a username and, and an email, right? But that's not standard protocols. That's just deals between providers, right? Um, and and it's, they're still not particularly popular. Um, more and more, you're getting, you're starting to get your, you know, um, customer facing tool. You're getting it from the same people who are giving you the service. You get your uh, email client, the one that you run in the browser, you get it from Google, right? Or from Microsoft or whoever is giving you your service. So you tr you're trusting the code. So, so you, Therefore, that's you're it. trusting them already. That's it. So, yes. <laughs> Implicitly, so from that yeah. point, whatever they give you as an end-to-end -end encryption tool verifier right. comes from them. So when you're trusting that tool and it tells you, yep, you're secure, you're now trusting the entity that you're trying to protect yourself from. But so if you trust their word when they tell you you're double protected, why wouldn't you trust their word yeah. when they tell you, well, we're not reading your data, <laughs> right? What, what makes it... I kind of think with Zoom, it would have been resolved if they just didn't had lied to their customers and told them they were double protected. Of course. That was sort of the well, source was, of this issue. That was you know? exactly it. Like none of it would yeah. have been a problem if Zoom never said they had end-to-end -end encryption. Um, because right. because it, it's, it's fine, Zoom. Like people are like... Um, well, I, I would say that many people are not even thinking too much about it, but it's, look, as long as the person right here, um, you know, next to me on the hotspot or my internet provider, as long as they cannot read what I do, I'm, I'm, I probably feel safe enough. But then Zoom come and tell you, we have end-to-end -end encryption. And then someone says, right. no, you don't. And they go, well, actually, by end-to-end -end encryption, we actually mean <laughs> between the end of the server and the end of your client. Like, it was this horrible. It was just horrible. Um, there's there's a, a favorite psychologist of mine that says there is nothing that destabilizes people more than a delta between reality and your expectation of reality. So when you felt unmet expectations, right? Is that that's the thing that that we detest the most. So whatever it is, if you if 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 you were told one thing and it happens to be another, it becomes like we. I mean, we take it very deeply psychologically. Our, our pores open up. Our adrenaline goes high. We're it's it's a it's an unexpected situation. There's a you've snake been, in the grass, and yeah. you're supposed to maybe run yeah. or fight or whatever. And 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 so, well, they didn't have it. So everyone turned around and started saying, "Well, do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it?" Um, yeah. <laughs> and at that point, well, it was a cool geek yeah. project. So why the hell not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we feel we feel almost like we have to have it now as a result. But like from a from a security perspective, you know, like uh, you know, we trust that our service provider is is giving us valid, you know, a valid service and isn't looking at these things, you know. And I and I I can kind of get like if you're someone that is really security focused. I mean, there are use cases obviously for it, you know, but it seems to be to me to be like one off use cases, you know, like government. Well, even so, for these use cases, it's that, like, I, honestly, I I don't quite. I don't quite get what you're going to get from. You're still trusting yes. the provider because the provider could give you. Yeah, if you're if you're FIPS certified and you're doing encryption and 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 you're using any kind of third party service and they're the ones that are giving you the code that you're running. I don't care if you have the right SSL library or whatever. You know, it's still you're still compromised. You know, they still could rat out your keys. They could still. I mean, you know, well, absolutely. you know, I'll, I'll tell you this and and. Uh, uh, look, if you if you if you don't trust if you, if, if 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 like. If, if 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 your provider wants to compromise you, they could actually have real end-to-end -end encryption and never see your key and still get the entire content of your conference. Like they only need to open a separate connection from the client to some dumping place, and you're going to send it there. And then you're going right. to tell me, uh, well, I'll see the network traffic to a different address. Or would you now? Well, we'll send it to the same IP address and get it from there. Like there's, um, it's it's just yeah. forget it. It's or send it locally. 
and then like upload it later. Or that, or that. I mean, it's it's, there's. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and, but then people become smart yeah. and they, they just say, well, but that means individual attacking and, and, and yeah, well, um, right. But if you're talking about this, all of this only really matters for high value targets. Like if you, um, right. but those are the ones that have concern as well. And, and, and it's just uh, yeah. like, for example, in the case of Jitsi, I would say that's your perfect security tool because we've made it so easy for you to just go and run it on any server anywhere in the world in like three commands. Um, the, the, when you have that, that's that, that's all you need. Whether or not some, if if that is always going to be infinitely more secure, with or without end-to-end encryption, compared to any centralized cloud service provider that tells you that they're also giving you end-to-end encryption. You put it in your own cloud on your yes. VPN, like in your local server farm or whatever, and like yeah, be way more secure than any anyone that would ever say end-to-end encryption or anything. You don't have to trust anyone yeah. but yourself. And and yeah. I'll tell you this. Uh, I'm not going to give specifics. We actually saw an attack on the popular meeting stool recently where um, the popular meeting stool was compromised and, and people were setting up a, a, a parallel conference and it, we're not even sure that it was actually completely <laughs> intentional. It might have been a bug. I'm not sure that it was done to compromise people, uh, but it ended up having these parallel conferences. So people were were streaming you know, they they were part of their conference with that other popular tool, and they're streaming uh, a, a duplication of all the streams. And there were hundreds of thousands of people who were using this thing, and no one ever noticed. So, so this were these were potentially people wow. who, you know, might have been eavesdropped on. Um, no one, no one knows. Uh, and you know, that other tool might have advertised end to end encryption, and it wouldn't even be lying, and it would still be. A total cluster compromised yeah. leap. So, you know, what can I say? It was it was so, a, it was a browser extension that was adding this. It was a popular browser extension that was adding this to one of the the other services. So it was it was very it was a perfect illustration of why yeah, end to end encryption. You know, right? It's something. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. This has probably been a very interesting year for you and your team. Like I, you said, you have, you've had people on your project that have been there for 10 plus mm-hmm. years. Um, at what point did you notice that like 2020 was going to be different for everyone? And like that, that your tool, that Jitsi would become kind of almost the center of, um, or, or video conferencing would suddenly become so mainstream and important. Um, I think that was uh, 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 when the Italy lockdown started, and and uh, you know we woke up one night with alarms of the services down, uh, and then that went on for five days. Uh, so so they're like usage was growing. I think so. What what would it be? It it was it was tripling every day for a week. And we would go and we would, you know, fix a bunch of bugs and we would spin off like like double the servers. Um, and, and, and then the next day it would prove to be ridiculously insufficient. Um, <laughs> and we would get woken up through the night. It was, it was, it was like we, we, beca- we became this 24-hour team and then we have people from Europe and from the U.S. And, and it was just these constant meetings trying to figure out with a lot, a lot of monster was involved. And... Uh, was this just hitting meet that Jitsi? That, that started with me, Jitsi. Yeah, although eight by eight VC also oh, wow. also grew a lot. But um, luckily, uh, very early on, we 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 were able to 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 you know um, to patch it up quickly because like it's funny because our entire architecture was in theory built for endless scaling. And we were so proud of it, like really you know condescending and like oh yeah, we would just scale horizontally and then vertically, and it, we would give you this entire spiel and. Um, and, 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 and it wasn't wrong. We, we honestly believe that. And then, and then you, you turn this on, you ramp up, you know, the traffic and you realize that there are all these places and little processes in place. I, I never even like noticed this site thing was working there. Like for example, um, so it turns out that, um, uh, on, on one of our load balancer servers, one of the HA proxies, um, had one of the processes 
had an insufficient file descriptor limit, right? And and of course, it sounds almost like, oh my God, what a bunch of noobs. But it's like, but wait a second. In our defense, we're not talking about the <laughs> file descriptor limit on your main server, on your secondary server, on anything. It's like a site processing a load balancer that you know accepts connections. And at some point, someone did that. It, but it's literally just one for HA proxy. Like, was it isolated only so to HA first proxy? Of all, or so was first it? of all, it was. Uh, it was. It was actually in HA proxy. You have multiple file descriptor limits because you have the front end connections and you have the back end connections, right. and they kind of mirror on on both sides. And then there was. Um, I I think it was one of these two that didn't have its file descriptor limit ramped up. The other one was properly up because the, that's the first thing. Yeah, let me make sure I can have enough connections here. And then you forget that there's another one. And frankly, I, I could make some criticism on the usability on why did you need two options for that HA proxy? Honestly, can you just not apply the same on both? Um, <laughs> but, but and, and there were a bazillion other things like that. That was just like, um, you know, we use Prosody as, as a signaling server and um, it turns right. out that, oh, well, who would have thought that if you, you know, do 200 times the traffic and this little thing here would explode because it actually starts reading, like starts parsing too much messages. Like, so, so that was, um, that was quite challenging. And I remember the first happy hour that we did after this was, uh, this was done. It was probably one of the most satisfying moments of my life. It's, it was just, everyone was completely exhausted, but we had, we had had the first, our first day with, uh, I think it was two and a half million daily active users and not a single glitch. And, and we, well, that felt, that felt pretty good. So it's, it's, uh, so for, for a startup like us, that is the most invaluable thing, right? That experience that you guys went through, the fact that, you know, I, we, we, I never have scaled to that level, you know, at higher view, we had 20, 30,000 active interviews that came in. Um, you know, we originally used lie code and stuff. We had a lot, a lot of the same challenges. We, we moved to, uh, Jitsi Me and, uh, I, I don't know, since maybe they've moved to Media Soup or whatever since I left. I don't know. But, um, the, the, you know, we had similar problems, you know, like, uh, with scaling even to the small scale. Cause we, you know, like, and I know how you say it's a noob thing, but there's just so many things to pay attention to, you yeah. know. And so for a, a startup team like us, like, I, I've been through, a small percentage of that pain, like of trying to deploy a solution like this and especially doing it on a global scale. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that's stable and the fact that you guys are scaling it to that level is a huge, huge win for us, you know, cause it's like, we know as a fact, like if in our wildest dreams, if we're, if we're as successful as we want to be, um, we're not going to even come close to hitting what you guys are, are probably targeting on a daily basis as far as the number of customers hitting your, servers and such, you know, so I think it's a, it's a really, that's a super cool to hear that story from you about like that, those pains and stuff. You know, I think anyone that's worked in DevOps, it's like the th most thankless job in the world, you know, and they know all, if everything's working, you don't get any praise at all. And if everything breaks down, then you're an idiot, you know? And so like, uh, the fact that you guys are, are going through that, you know, I like, certainly, certainly nobody thinks that you're an idiot because of some eclectic HA proxy configuration setting that's causing everything to blow up. That's just the name of the game, you know, but I'm so glad that you guys are handling that game and we're not at CoScreen, you know, like it's freeing us up to spend so much more time on our product and, and designing things that, you know, matter to our differentiation to, you know, on the video conferencing approach, right? We're building this team collaboration tool. We want to think about team collaboration all day. We don't want to think about HA proxy, yeah. right? And, and it's a it's a huge value add to well, us. Well, thank you so, so much for saying that. Uh, what well, it, it, it's it's yeah. it's very satisfactory, to, satisfying to hear you say it because it's um, it's 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 our metric of self worth. Uh, so uh, that's the value that we hope to Great. give you. I'm 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 glad that um, I'm, I'm very appreciative that you are saying this. Okay, so um, one last question. Thank you for bearing with us. I know this has been quite a long. You know, and it's been very interesting. Oh, it's my though. pleasure so, entirely. It's um, my pleasure. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so, moving, you know, like right now, uh, you know, Jitsi, I know, like stable, it's BP8, and you know, I know there's some H.264 support, but you guys, because of uh, temporal simulcast and other crap, like, like you know, it's not really officially supported. Uh, last I heard, there was some idea of like uh, in enabling VP9 yeah, support. so so VP9 support is or AV1 right. as well. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I think we accumulated some lag. So it's, um, 
Uh, we should use a better meeting stool next time. Um, just yeah, just we saying. should. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I, I didn't mean anything. I'm sure that the Riverside folks have done a great job, uh, especially with the post production site. Um, we should probably get together and we should we could actually you know help them with their uh, with their front end part. Um, but yeah. but um, so uh, we we actually have VP9 support already merged in master uh if i'm not mistaken uh this has you know this has actually been um an under development for a while um i think we should probably get together with you folks and figure out uh when to turn you when to turn you on it because i know that for 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 you it would matter uh one of the things that uh we that that are kind of a problem with webrtc applications is that um you know, doing video in a browser um, ends up uh, being a rather convoluted task for, uh, on the one hand, the generic nature of the browser, because it has to do many other things. And then on the other hand, uh, its openness to the world and the security implications of that. So you end up with these very convoluted pipelines of um, um, for, for by transmission and like they're, and, and they're all running as separate processes and there's, you know, all the rendering and, and, and well yeah. rendering but also it's just like the parts that that receive the yeah. bytes over the network and then the parts that then handle them within the browser and the parts that render them and all of them communicate with inter-process communication and um so you end yeah. up spending a lot of cpu on stuff and and that is you know people complaining about their fans is an issue with with webrdc and vp9 certainly doesn't make that better um uh, um, so, so we were in, uh, you know, not in a particular hurry. And AV1 makes it even worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, uh, well, hopefully they they would make it better before uh, it, it becomes mainstream. But uh, for for people like you who uh, look, we get it, but we're doing something else here. We actually want more pixels. Um, it 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 actually uh, makes a lot of sense. So I think we we can work with you folks to see how to enable you to do to do VP9 on Jazz. So um, so that you could also give your users a better. Experience. Yeah, we're interested in it. The CPU CPU is a big deal for us too. You know, like um, everyone's always comparing us to Zoom, right? And so like we're not even doing H.264 yet. And um, you know, like I I do think that like in the long term we would we would absolutely prefer lower CPU usage over quality, but obviously that's a, that there's going to be a mix right between the quality of the streams we're providing and VP nine might may be able to give us better quality. Cause like the, you know, text getting garbled is just not something that people are going to forgive. Whereas video is something that people may not even yep. notice if it's, you know, if the, the, the overall quality goes down, people are, aren't going to notice mm -hmm. it as much. So, um, you know, and I know like, for instance, like Stadia claims that they're using VP9, you know, we've seen articles that come out that say that they're actually just doing high bit rate H.264 at a very high, you know, high, high bit rate. Even I even, you know, looked and it looked like they were doing like base profile H.264 at a very, very high bit rate. Maybe that's based on. Oh, like, really? You actually looked at a, something they take at a, a Stadia browser. call? Yeah. So there's, I, I can send you, I can send you, there's a link. To, I, I wasn't, I, I went and looked at the, um, just Chrome WebRTC internals while I was in a Stadia session, and uh, you know you can see that it's that they have uh, they're doing base profile H.264, and there's a, a I wonder why they would do that article that came out recently where they said that I I mean according to their public docs they say that they're doing quick in VP9 and that may be what they're doing on their device so this is like on the web browser which is much easier you know you can go look at it and it might just be because they need to use Vanilla WebRTC or something. I'm, yeah, I'm but not I still quite don't sure understand why, why they would right? and they, why they would privilege VP8 over H.264. What would they get out of H.264 that they don't get from VP8? I don't know. It's a great question, right? I don't I have no idea why, but that's you know, like that. It would be an interesting thing to look at. You know, for us, it, it's somewhat relevant. You know, because for, well, it, it's not as relevant because we're not Stadia, right? We're not. We don't have servers that are in a back end that are extremely beefy that can produce whatever you know, whatever output we want, right? We have two clients and, you know, they're, they're capturing the screen and, and doing mm. composition of all these buffers together and stuff. So there's a bunch of extra work that has to be done there on a laptop, right? And so we are encoding not on a server, but on, on these devices. And so, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, um, it's an interesting thing, right? And at some point they were talking about doing BBR, but then they removed BBR from, 
from LibWebRTC, and uh, it looks like they're using just uh, like sender side congestion control. Um, you know, according according to this recent News Not Wine Combinator article that did did the reverse the Stadia protocol. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's um, it's it's interesting. Uh, I I, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I am absolutely fascinated by Stadia. I'm I'm a customer uh, of Stadia, and uh, oh, really? yeah, and uh, it's I I just love like I cannot like there's something so deeply satisfying knowing that when you're holding your joystick and and when you move a button, it goes to many many miles away from you. It does <laughs> something, and that comes many many miles back to you, and you see the the reaction and like your, I just cannot stop thinking how the joystick that I hold has actually no connection to the computer where I'm seeing the thing. It's just happening so far away from me. So I really like that. And the other thing is like, I'm absolutely impressed with, you know, uh, with like, I would, I would, I was looking at Cyberpunk the other day and, and you would just turn around. I was just turning around uh, this huge, you know, landscape. Um, um, and, and it was just going, swirling in front of me so so quickly and there was not a glitch and i was thinking some users have problem doing five frames per second sharing their desktop this is like a desktop share of 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 like yeah you know at least an adp and in some cases it's 4k so it's it's absolutely i think i think they've done phenomenal work now obviously uh, they they have the advantage of having a lot more knowledge about the objects that they're sharing, so they can use that. And I think that's what they're doing. They leverage that information in the encoder, um, so that they can produce a very tight right. stream um, that that can do all of that. Um, but they still have to be using vanilla decoders, right? So it's not like they have all the freedom in the world. Uh, so I'm and it is yeah vanilla lib web rtc on the decoding yes. side you know so they they obviously have the functionality there to do what they want to and it may be different i, I know were you using it on the console I, yeah i've used it on all the devices the... that i can just for the heck of it so okay. on my phone uh, on the um uh, on the chromecast on my computer uh, on my ipad so it's and it just i just love how it works everywhere you guys are going to have to help us do this with Jitsi. Well, let's so. do it. That's the. <laughs> let's do it. All right. The minute you you guys start ex- well, experimenting man, was... with encoding, we'd be very happy to, to to do that. Yeah. So um. Yeah, it's been great chatting with you. I I don't know if you have any questions for us. Uh, I I'm um, I I am just uh, uh really excited to see where where you guys are headed. I absolutely love. Um, the the product notion, the product uh, you know um, uh, concept of uh, of CoScreen, and um, I I I think that's uh, uh, that, that's a great tool uh, that pushes remote work in the right direction. Um, so I'm I'm sure you guys are going to be successful, and I am just looking forward to seeing under what shape that will happen. Mm-hmm.